Welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I get my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's review is the second scenario from A Night at the Opera, Visid, for Delta Green the role-playing game by Arc Dream Publishing. Ok, first a bit of history. Visid was the first stretch goal achieved in 2015's successful Delta Green Kickstarter. It was released as a PDF and a print on demand in early 2018, and then later in A Night at the Opera, and is designed to be played over two to three sessions. We are first greeted with a brief introduction that sets the stall for the scenario. It talks about one of Majestic's leaders, Gavin Ross, who has been in hiding for years since the dissolution of the group in 2001, and who has lived under various identities. He's well over 70 but looks a vibrant, healthy 60 due to Project Arc Dream that delved into alien science and the secrets of human DNA. Since being diagnosed with cancer in 2012, he has been taking ARD15, a tiny blue pill created by Arc Dream that arrests cellular degeneration, holding off death. Unfortunately for him, these pills are almost gone. Once you start taking it, you can't stop. Ross, having a history of licensing alien technology, has hired a private contractor to try and recreate ARD15, and that is when the deaths begin. Ross has coerced a former Arc Dream researcher, Dr. Tibalt Greaves, to recreate ARD-15 from some unprocessed tissue samples that it was originally extracted from. The culture, known as Blue Blood, is the remains of a majestic operative that was originally tested on. US Air Force First Lieutenant Daniel Uli, who was consumed and rendered down to cellular material. Uli, however, didn't exactly die. His consciousness is trapped in every cell of Blue Blood, something he is aware of and that has driven him insane. Greaves, working in a secret biohazard lab at his home, accidentally awoke Uli. The thing that Uli had become promptly killed Greaves and his girlfriend, devoured part of their biomass, then escaped. The local police and CDC are now involved, and other bodies infected with blue blood have turned up, alerting Delta Green. To complicate matters further, every sample of blue blood thinks that it is the one true Uli, and has one desire, to return to Uli's wife and child in Montana and enact a horrific reunion. The Uli thing, having fed on Greaves, has begun a biological chain reaction which has started to form a rudimentary structure to enable it to move. It then killed Greaves' living girlfriend, Amanda, who discovered the Uli thing, which at this point looked like a grotesque spider-like creature. It leapt on her and fed again, growing strong enough to move further. At this point it is the size of a large dog. Sunlight destroys blue blood and quickly did so to what remained within Greaves as he had staggered outside. Uli thing number one has managed to find refuge in an abandoned trailer. It sleeps during the day and hunts at night, eating local pets and assimilating biomass. At one point it grows big enough that it starts making its way to the address of his wife and child. It will leave a chain of death behind it. If possible, the situation is actually worse than it seems. On October the 2nd, the day before Delta Green are contacted, the CDC ordered a sample of the unknown biological substance found in Greaves' house to be flown to Atlanta for study. During the flight, Uli Thing No. 2 awakened and overwhelmed the two-man crew, causing it to crash in Clearwater National Forest, Idaho. Uli Thing No. 2 survived the impact and consumed the crew, growing to the size of a small bear, and then began its journey to Montana. All that was found of the plane is a smouldering wreck, lots of blood, but no bodies, and aluminium sample cases blown out from the inside. And again, the situation gets even worse. The remains of Amanda reconstitute at the Snohomish County Medical Examiner's Office, where her corpse is waiting to have an autopsy performed on it and goes on a killing spree. By October the 15th, it'll be around a ton in mass and arrive in Montana, each Uli thing believing that they are the one true Daniel Uli. A reunion with his wife and child can only mean consumption. Behind the scenes, Gavin Ross has set all of this in motion. He gained access to old Majestic files through Robert Justin Ortega, the illegitimate son of a former director of Majestic, Justin Croft. Croft had remotely oversaw his son's welfare and left him with many secrets on his 21st birthday. Cherry-picked projects worth billions of dollars. Posing as Michael Bellick, he acted as a supportive uncle and friend of his dead father. As Bellick, he explained the secrets that had been left to him and Ortega respects and values his advice. Many valuable but harmless patents have been passed through Ortega's company and sealing. Bellick recovered the bluebird samples and sent them to Greaves, but upon his death, scrambled a team to clean the house and distance him from any wrongdoings. 
He ordered his mercenaries to firebomb the agency of a private detective he had hired to convey everything to Greaves. The fire destroyed not only the officers, but the mini mall they were attached to. The following day, Bellock's operatives tracked down the PI, Evelyn Wells, and shot her with a high-powered rifle. Somehow, she survived and is in hospital in a medically induced coma. She will wake up on October the 12th and give the police a description of her shooter and the license plate of his car, along with the information on the oddities she delivered to Greaves, that is, unless the agents get involved. Following this, we have a section detailing the briefing the agents get for the mission, codenamed Malta. It gives us a summary with a detailed timeline for them and then it goes into investigating Greaves. It details various methods that the agents can use and tells us what can be dug up, as well as his secret history. His body disintegrated when sunlight hit it into a toxic, unidentifiable goo. Fortunately, the transformation was captured over a series of 16 photos. It then goes on to show how they can investigate Greaves' girlfriend, Amanda Griffin. As mentioned previously, her body was moved to the morgue for further analysis, but will erupt into Uli Thing 3 on October 5th. It also gives information on the resident medical examiner, Dr. Louis Stubbs, and how he can actually be recruited. Although given his tenacity to piss you all leads till the bitter end, it may cause him to actually become the mission. It also demonstrates how the players can examine Amanda's remains and discover the blue blood compound. Greaves' house can also be looked into. He has had a full biohazard lab installed professionally. Various clues and leads can be discovered here. Tiny, malformed, bloody footprints can be discovered, as well as documentation that links the building of the lab of Potentia Holdings LLC, which leads to an employee called Aaron Silverman and his law firm Marcus Silverman and Green, whose largest payout for personnel goes to Robert Justin Ortega. The neighbours can be questioned and will report missing pets, as well as information on the PI that was hired. Also of interest are the crows. When Greaves was discovered, two crows were feeding on his corpse. This has allowed the blue blood to pass on to them, although for some reason it hasn't been able to exert control. If they can be tracked down, they can be found with strange coloured feathers and scaly extrusions, as well as one of them having three digits from a human hand. This can actually be fingerprinted and lead to Daniel Uli, although capturing creatures as smart as crows could prove difficult. Also of interest here is Ernesto Torres, the delivery man who discovered Greaves. He can inform the agents about the crows. Next up is the private detectives, Dino, Belton and Wells. It gives information on the timeline of Wells being hired and also on the subsequent burning down of the officers and strip mall attached to it. Various lines of FBI and fire service chatter will reveal that arson is suspected, probably thermite. Dino was away from the office on a fishing trip, so is dumbfounded as to why someone would want to do this and Wells is in the Swedish Medical Centre in an induced coma, recovering from a gunshot wound. This leaves Belton. He has private suspicions about the attack, as he knows that Wells was working for a high-paying client, Potentia Holdings. If approached by federal agents who seem legitimate, he will provide them with a brief case of information he has gleaned. This will link Potentia Holdings, Robert Justin Ortega and Marcus Silverman and Green to events. He also reveals that he has hired four men to keep guard on Wells, as he rightly so fears for her life. Information on their digital records is also given, although they are heavily corrupted for some reason. Following this is information on Bellock's mercenaries. They consist of three people, Earl R. Daniels, a ruthless asset who is a former CIA operative, and retired Sergeant Major Charles A. Soriano, an Afghanistan veteran and specialist in improvised weapons and explosives, and Lila Maston, a former US Army sergeant. After their failed attempt to kill Wells, their next plan of action is for Maston to pose as a flower delivery driver to locate her room and attempt another sniper shot. If this plan is thwarted, they plan to launch an assault on a room, killing anyone in their path. After this, we have the law firm, Marcus Silverman and Green. It gives details on the firm's history and how they are almost exclusively dedicated to Robert Justin Ortega's firm and Seal Limited. Access can easily be gained to their offices due to the staff keeping strict hours, but the sheer amount of data, mostly in paper form, may overwhelm them. They can find information here on Justin Croft. Croft's past is generally murky, but investigations should lead the agents towards a storage facility that he bought in Jordan Springs, Virginia. Their investigations, if not played correctly, could lead to a visit from his mercenaries. Any digging into his company, Marsh Technologies, will result in a tense call from their case officer to stop pursuing that line of inquiry. It also gives you information on Robert Justin Ortega and Anne Sealink. Founded in 2012, and Sealink has patented a substance called Titanite Weave, and Ortega is known as an engineering genius. 
Investigations into him will reveal someone who has a reputation as a genius publicly, but in actuality he is far from it. It then goes on to detail the Jordan Springs storage. Stored here under incredibly secure guard is the secret to unsealing, being as successful as they are. Contained in one of the sheds is research into alien technology worth billions of dollars, although actually being able to access this is a very difficult task. The sheds are rigged to explode if they're tampered with, and all of the guards are paid very well and are very good at their job. Next up it details Michael Bellock, aka Gavin Ross. Formerly a leader of Majestic, he is currently masquerading as Michael Bellock, and pretty much every piece of evidence that agents can find points to this. The only way of locating Bellick is to Robert Justin Ortega as they meet up once a month, should the agents choose to trail Ortega to find out. The scenario gives possible outcomes for the eventuality of the players confronting him about his past. He is the very model of cool-headed and always operates a dozen steps ahead of the agents. If they reveal their connection to Delta Green, he will let the players know that he knows about Delta Green and can even become their patron should events push in that particular direction. It also details what will happen to Bellick should he be starved of ARD-15, which is a gruesome death. Following this, we have information on CDC Flight 191. Investigating this will reveal a smouldering ruin, no bodies with plenty of blood, and the aforementioned unknown biological substance 1 case. It then goes on to detail the early things. They are a lot more capable than the players will probably suspect, as they are not mindless blobs of insanity. They can remember how to drive, use a telephone and the like, though they're not above being tricked by canny agents, who, if they identify it by name, can cause the creature to pause in confusion. Mentioning Uli's wife will cause them to go into a killing frenzy. It then details 10441 Great Skyway. The Uli things believe that their wife Isabella still lives at 19099 Pulaski Street, Billings, but the phone number is the same. It gives us a map of the house and gives us a small bit of information on Isabella Uli and their son, Malcolm Uli. The final section gives us rewards for a resolution and a detailed timeline of events for the handler to track. It then stats out the main characters of the piece, including stats for the three Uli things that are described in gruesome detail. Visid, for me, captures a particular facet of Delta Green that I love. The combination of alien-inspired body horror, along with a scenario that doesn't pull a single punch that throws, is an absolute winner. The amount of detail presented for each section of the investigation is at times annoyingly thorough. While reading, I found myself thinking, what if they do this? And then upon further reading, I would discover the very line of inquiry that I imagined, detailed. It's very well presented, and must serve as a great introduction to new players of the system. The early things are horrifically realised, and the details on the past of the various personalities are compelling to read. However, that is not to say that it's without fault. I had to read it twice before I fully understood each character, their motivations, and how they were joined together. Also, while the art is great throughout, I actually wanted more of it. A few portraits of the main players would have greatly aided my understanding of the scenario, as it would have been so much easier to put a face to a name. Additionally, the finale is not fully realised. Some guidance on how to play out the final confrontation with the Uli things would help new handlers and have made it a lot more satisfying. These, however, are small gripes in the grand scheme of things. Visit is a really well realised scenario, and one that I think would be a good one for new handlers, as it's fairly self-contained and with events playing out in an ABC manner, with plenty of investigation and some potential adrenaline-filled fights along the way. I give it an 8.5 out of 10. The next review in this series will be music from a darkened room, so until then, but out. <laughs>